Hello friends, followers and channel members, welcome to another video here in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 where today we are going to be taking a flight on the newly released PMDG DC-6. Now, PMDG, as you may or may not be aware if you're new to the world of Flight Simulator, create highly realistic, steady level aircraft for the Flight Simulator world. And this is their first aircraft for Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. So very, very excited to, uh, to showcase this airliner for you. Now, in this video, we're going to be basically looking at flying a circuit of an airfield and introducing the bare minimum basics to you for those of you that may be brand new to flying this aircraft. Now, disclaimer, I am in no way uh, going to showcase this video off as a must-do tutorial. I am uh, not uh, anywhere near proficient enough on this airliner to be able to tell you what you must and mustn't do. What I will be able to do is basically show you that the first time in the aircraft, uh, what you should and shouldn't do in order to maintain a, a basically a general safe circuit until you've had a chance to go in and read the full 366 page manual that comes with this airliner. So we're going to be looking at a few do's and don'ts and basically how we can try and make your life a little bit easier if you've just got your hands on this and um, things like setting up the autopilot as well for uh, for those long haul sectors that you can do. Bear in mind this aircraft was capable of crossing the Atlantic uh, off the top of my head. I'm not sure how long that uh, that would have taken but uh, I'm sure someone will let me know down in the comments. So we're going to try and make this a, a first step easy guide as easy as possible to flying this aircraft. Just before I go any further, I uh, think we should all take a moment just to appreciate the uh, absolute brilliance of PMDG and how amazing they've got this aircraft lo looking. I love all the real metallic uh, reflections that you can see uh, everywhere as we uh, as we take the drone camera out and around. We've got uh, dirty engines as, uh, as well and you can set so many things up so you've got uh, all the engineer's uh, steps as uh, as well as what uh, you see here. We're currently sat on the ground at uh, Robin Hood, Doncaster, Sheffield Airport. Nice long runway here, ex-military base, uh, now used for commercial aviation. Um, so we're going to uh, take off on runway 02 as we're, uh, as we're currently sat on at the moment. We're then going to fly a circuit, as I say, and we'll uh, look at using uh, the ILS instruments and a uh, NDB as well to help us locate where the airfield is once we've got airborne. So let's um, let's have a look and get inside and the first thing you'll notice as well is the interior. Oh my that's not an Airbus uh, flight deck is it? Look at all those gauges, steam powered gauges. Um, it looks like an extremely complicated Cessna uh, which in a sense that's, <laughs> that's what it is. Um, but we've got a little bit of uh, modern uh, technology over here with the use of the uh, the electronic flight bag or tablet, whatever you wish to uh, call that. Now, one of the things that I am going to be using for this quick flight is the artificial flight engineer. And if you are new to the aircraft, then I cannot recommend using the artificial flight engineer enough. I would not be able to fly this aircraft at all. I probably wouldn't be able to get it off the ground, uh, let alone started without the help of the the flight engineer. So in the real world, this aircraft was flown by uh, by two pilots and a flight engineer who uh, would uh, presumably sit uh, on this little uh, chair. Doesn't look very comfy, but. Um and as you can see, as I'm clicking away, everything is animated. Almost everything in this uh, flight deck works and serves a purpose. Uh, let's just pop that back up. Uh, even though we are going to have our artificial flight engineer here in uh, in a second to get things going. So, yep, he will run all the checks for you and he will flick the levers around to make sure you can get, uh, get airborne nice and safely. And he will do a lot of things such as controlling uh, the engines and looking after the engine power which takes a lot of reading and understanding, which I sadly haven't had the time to do yet, but the flight engineer, of course, is aware of everything that, uh, that needs to happen. That's not to say it doesn't sometimes come without quirks, and if that happens, then I'll be able to show you how we can get around those. If it doesn't happen, then uh, I'll quickly uh, touch on those once we've uh, hopefully landed back down safely. So, 
first thing I'm going to do is go to our ramp manager we can see we've got everything open at the moment and we've got the ground power unit on so let's just go ahead and start uh, closing all of those we need to close the cabin stairs before we can close the cabin exit you may even be able to hear the um, the stairs being uh, being closed behind me <laughs> that's fantastic so let's uh, let's close that up and the ground power unit is connected now the ground power unit you're used to seeing the uh, the big sort of tug thing that comes out uh, well the ground power unit on the uh, the DC6 is uh, it's essentially just a little uh, battery that you can see sat underneath just behind the um, the nose wheel uh, so there it is the uh, the battery which is the uh, the GPU for the uh, DC6 and we know that that is working as we have got confirmation of that up uh, up here and we're currently on ground power as uh, as you can see just there so we're going to uh, let the flight engineer do a few pre-flight checks so if i now go to the flight engineer let's do our before start checks and you're going to hear him talking through and flicking loads of switches which i have no idea what he's flicking through i haven't had time to read as i say the uh, full 366 page manual that comes with this so let's uh, let's click this and just have a quick listen Just making sure all those doors are closed, and you should come back and tell us that that's all completed. Closed. There we go. Door warning lights. Out. Gear pins. Removed. Three on board. Seat belts and pedals. Adjusted. Throttles. Set to idle. Propellers. Forward and three. Start checks complete. Start engines. Okay, so we're now ready to start the engines. One of the things that you will have seen here is the uh, the thrust levers. Uh, if, if they even call <laughs> if they even call that the throttle levers, um, automatically moving. One of the things that you must do, or rather must not do, is uh, touch your throttle lever at this moment in time. Leave it at idle and leave it at idle for most of the flight, as your flight engineer is going to control that for you. Um, there are eight throttle levers, which is a little bit confusing considering there are only four engines, of course, uh, but they are uh, they, they are sort of linked to uh, link together. So uh, it is one per engine at uh, both sides for the uh, the pilot and uh, and the first officer. So we're now ready to start the uh, start the engines. What we could have done before that as well, I haven't done just for this little uh, video but we can go to the ramp manager and uh, sorry not the ramp manager the fuel loading manager we could have loaded uh, baggage we could have loaded passengers etc obviously I'm I wouldn't dare trust anybody or want anyone to put their lives in my hands on this uh, on this flight while I am still learning how to uh, how to fly so we've no bags we've no passengers and we've got a gross weight of the aircraft now that becomes important now because the gross weight of the aircraft as shown here determines what kind of takeoff we are going to do there are two types and if we come back to the uh, flight engineer page you can see that we will be able to do either a uh, dry takeoff or a wet takeoff now the magic number determining uh, determining which one we use is the ooh, let's come to the right page is 87,600 pounds so if we are below 87,600 pounds, which we are this time, we can do a dry takeoff. If we are above 87,600 pounds, we have to do what's called a wet takeoff. Now, when I first jumped into the uh, into the aircraft, uh, I was rather confused because the dry takeoff, wet takeoff, I was thinking it had to be something to do with the weather. It, uh, it of course, is not. It 
uh, instructs the uh, the engineer as to whether we are going to be using water injection into the engines uh, for our takeoff or not. So the heavier we are, we have water injection in to improve the uh, the performance. Uh, but dry takeoff today, as we're not that heavy, so we'll be selecting the dry takeoff. So we're now ready to start the engines, and this we have to do manually. Our flight engineer shall not do this, uh, not do this for us. So this is uh, this is kind of neat. What we uh, need to do is the order that we start the engines is three, four, two, one, and what we're going to do first of all is check that the ignition is set to both. This is for engine number three, one, two, three, and four, of course. So that's set to number three. The main fuel boost pumps is set to low. Engine selector is number three, and now we're going to uh, start. So we pull the middle button just here. Three. And the flight engineer is now Six. counting the rotations of the blades. Five. Once he gets to 12, 12, we're going to select boost and prime. At this point then, hopefully engine number three is starting to uh, rotate and come up to full power. We can obviously check as well that We've got um, that we've got good oil pressure starting to rise, as you can see. And once we have got a, a sort of positive engine start, if you like, then the start, prime, and boost switches will automatically reset, so we can now continue with uh, the next engine. And I am just going to touch upon uh, this because I think it's fantastic. You can feel and see the cabin shaking. Look at the needles; they're all rocking slightly. And if I come down here, look, everything is vibrating away. Now we've got that engine started. I think that's really, really neat. I've not seen that in any other uh, aircraft in Microsoft Flight Sim 2020 so far. So let's go ahead and do the next engine, which is going to be engine number four. So we're going to come up here, we're going to select both, we're going to select engine number four, we're going to select the uh, main fuel booster pump to, oh, low, he does whilst uh, messing around. You just see, I've just moved that switch by mistake. That's the danger with this, everything works. There's, uh, there's almost no way, you, you've got to be very careful where your mouse is when you uh, are zooming in and out. Right, so that's uh, now all ready to set, so we're going to go start, and hopefully now, engine number four Six. is starting. Five. We'll best get back inside 12. to hit the boost and prime. There's engine number four, now uh, now starting. Ah, we've had a false start. Okay, that happens as it does in the real world. So we're going to have to do that again. Let's just check we've got everything all set. So, boost, that's low. Engine, select to number four, that's now reset. So let's start that again, see if we can get that fired up. So hit boost and prime. Let's see if we have uh, a bit more success this time. Okay, engine number four not wanting to start at the moment. So we'll give that uh, we'll give that another try. And what I think is worth pointing out at this point is you can go to the maintenance manager and double check to make sure that all engines are actually working because it remembers how uh, basically how well you've flown and managed your engines from flight to flight so as you can see the engine health is uh, is all good so we can now go to the stress visualizer and make sure everything's working as it should be just there yes it is so let's try and uh, let's try and do that once more. You can also top up your fluids as, uh, as well. There we go. So let's just top those up. Uh, I don't think that's going to make any difference to our engine start, but let's try that again. So engine number four to boost. Engine number four. That's set down. Engine number four. And let's start. realized actually 
have we got these set? No, we've not. That would be why. Right, okay. So, this is a great example of where um, you may or may not be getting stuck. Now, the flight engineer automatically set the uh, mixture to auto-rich for engine number three when we were starting it. As you can see, that's lifted right up to the top. However, as you can see, engine number four was down at the bottom, so it was actually cut off. The engine's not going to start. So we don't need to do engine number three. The flight engineer will take care of that for us because it's the first one. But engine numbers four, two, and one, we're going to have to do that for us. So let's try this again. Now we've got that uh, all set up. This should hopefully work. That's looking better. There we go. So, mistake number one on my part, and I guarantee there's going to be plenty more mistakes throughout this uh, video. As uh, as I said right at the start, I am certainly not a, a DC-6 expert, but hopefully we'll give you a little bit of context for those of you flying first time in this aircraft, and as you've just seen there, that may be a problem that some of you may have encountered. Okay, we're now going to do engine number two, but before we do that, we've now got engines three or four running. We can disconnect the GPU so they can remove that battery. So that's now gone. And we can select plane battery rather than the ground power. Okay, so let's do engine number two. So let's set that up to auto rich. We're now going to select both low engine number two and starting engine number two. Of course I'm going to have to repeat this for the next engine so feel free to skip through the next uh, minute or so and come Six. back when both engines are running. Five. Twelve. So that's twelve boost and prime And we can actually open the window as well if we unlock. Track that back. Can't quite stick my head out of the window, which is <laughs> a bit of a shame. But we'll be able to see engine number one in a moment. Let's close that. Uh, close that back up. So drag that shut again. There we go. Oh. engine number one and then the final engine safe to say starting the engines in the airbus is a lot quicker And what the flight engineer is actually doing is he is counting how many blades pass a specific point. So choose any point and count the blades. Once it gets to 12 blades past any specific point, then um, that's when we add the, uh, the boost. Right, so now engines 1, 2, 3 and 4 are all running. We're going to run the after start checklist from the flight engineer. So, after start. Start selected, bus bumps. Off and off. Battery switch. Plane benching. Generators and inverters. Check and on. Emergency lights. Armed. Ground power. Removed. After start checks complete. So what you may have noticed during that as well is the thrust levers, or throttles, uh, moved ever so slightly there, and that was uh, me with my hardware. I noticed they weren't quite at idle, and I said at the start, they need to be idle for the flight engineer to do his job correctly. Uh, so I just moved that back, and uh, as you can see, the flight engineer will now be able to control those. And all these needles and gauges are uh, where they should be, and all matched up uh, nicely. You'll also see a low... Um, 
low oil light uh, showing just here. Uh, that's uh, that's fine because the engines are at idle at the moment, so don't be too worried about uh, don't be too worried about that coming on. Okay, so next we do the before takeoff. So the flight engineer automatically will move the flaps for us, and that's confirmed then by the flap position gauge. We just wait until that gets up to 20. Flaps set to 20. Windows of turbine. Close that on. Controls. Gust lock released. So the gust lock has to be released, otherwise. You won't be able to uh, on. move any of the controls. Reach and, Reach and locked. Sit. Transponder. On. Landing lights. So the landing lights are about to be extended and turned on. Okay, so I've now got one more thing which I'm going to do. There are two different uh, radios that you can use on uh, on this aircraft, and that is the Azobo 430. That has GPS on it, or you can have the PMDG Bendix radios, no GPS. Well, there was no GPS around when the DC-6 originally flew, so just to keep things realistic, I'm going to fly this with no GPS radio selected. I'm just going to turn the brightness up as, uh, as well, just, uh, just there. So with no GPS, we're happy to use VOR and NDVs, just as they did um, in the real world back when, uh, when the aircraft first flew, and that is, uh, that is this aircraft up, uh, up here. You can flick between them very, very easily, so if I uh, selected that one, you'll see it changes, but I'm just going to pop that uh, pop that back. There we are. Uh, so I'm going to be flying, as I say, out of uh, Doncaster uh, Sheffield Airport. Um, if anyone wants to mimic this flight, Echo Golf Charlie November. So we're going to take off, and what I want to pop in is I want to pop in the ILS frequency, 110.95, and I also want to pop in the NDB338. Well, I've already got these preset into the standby. So the ADS is uh, shown just here, the automatic direction finder, and you'll also see it down here as well. So if you now flick that on to... Um, to the active frequency, this middle button just here, 338, move over from standby to active, there we go, 338, uh, and you'll see those are now spinning around, and we're effectively sat pointing at it, we're very close. Remember the NDB, and the non-directional beacon, which is displayed on the automatic direction finder, does not have any distance measuring equipment, so you don't know how far away you are from this, it just points towards the beacon, uh, which in this case is located right at the airfield, which is great. That means this beacon, wherever we fly, is going to be guiding me directly back to the airport. The other thing I'm then going to pop in is the ILS frequency for this runway, which is 110.95. And again, that uh, is going to be set up here, 110.95. And we will we'll flip that over and you should see this come to life. So there we've got a glide slope, which is the uh, horizontal line, and we've got the uh, localizer, the, uh, the vertical line. We're obviously sat on the runway, so right in the center of that. We've also got distance measuring equipment for this, we're 0 0.7 miles away. Okay, so with those, that's going to help us navigate back to the airfield once we've taken off. So in order to take off then, we're going to take off the parking brakes, but I'm now holding the manual brakes using uh, the manual brake button on my uh, control. So uh, keep that pressed because we're not going to release that until full power has been set by the flight engineer. So we're now going to do our takeoff. And as I said, it's going to be a dry takeoff because I weighted below it 7,600 pounds. So try takeoff. Let's go. 
You can see the flight engineer slowly moving the thrust levers up, all the throttles. And we're looking for 30 inches of pressure just here. So now we're going to full power. Once full power is set, we'll release those brakes and we'll start rolling down the runway. We're going to take off at around 100 knots. That's where we'll pull back very, very gently. Full power is set. Full power is set. So release the brakes. Off we go. Now, unlike the Airbus and perhaps anything else you may have flown, you have to be very, very gentle when you pull back on the column to rotate this aircraft. Pull back too quickly, it hasn't got the power to be able to maintain uh, safe flight and airspeed, and you want to be able to obviously gain that airspeed. So, 100 knots coming up, very gently starting to pull back now. Ensuring the airspeed continues to climb. Again, gear is controlled by the flight engineer. We don't need to do anything, just concentrate on flying the aircraft. <coughs> gear up, lights up, flaps up. Flaps going up. So flaps are now going up, and again, flight engineer takes care of that. And what I'm going to look for now is a climb rate of around 500 feet per minute, which doesn't sound very much as it compared to what we're used to in modern airlines. It's also a lot more difficult a lot more difficult to control and you can hear the flight engineer taking uh, taking control of the power settings and now what we're going to do is we're going to climb at 165 knots well the way to do that of course is raise the nose to start to slow down the rate of climb and I'll lower the nose Sorry, raise the nose to increase the rate of climb, slow down the airspeed, lower the nose, then to hold 165 knots. And there we are, we're holding around 165 knots, and again I'm using pitch attitude to, uh, to control that. Climb power set. After takeoff checklist, please. The okay, so now the after checks have been uh, after takeoff checks have been completed. Just to help control this, because otherwise you're going to be hands on for a very long time. You can use the trim wheel to sort of set the trim where you want it to uh, want it to be. So I'm going to let go of the side stick now. I say side stick. It's not a side stick, of course. That's my Airbus terminology coming through. And you can use the uh, the wheel here. Pull it back to increase the rate of climb, decrease the airspeed, and uh, and vice versa. So I'm just going to push that forward a little bit. As you can see, the airspeed just starting to drop off a little bit. So let's just push that back. And you have to be so so gentle with this. It's not like an Airbus with all its computers on board, which will uh, you you can roll the settings through, and the computer will then gradually make those changes for you. It's all mechanical, so you move those levers and um, it's, it's, it's going to happen almost instantly. Uh, and as you can see, I've still yet to, uh, to perfect this. So we're now at 3,000 feet. I want to try and level off now. So we're going to level off. We're just going to push down a little bit. We're going to make a turn and then I'm going to introduce the, uh, the autopilot or the gyropilot as it's called. Way! We need to look out the window. Look at that. As you can tell, I'm most certainly not familiar with flying this aircraft correctly just yet, but that's got our airspeed up nevertheless. So let me just pull back on, uh, on the stick a little bit. Let's get that level off. I want to try, as I say, and level that off. So we're uh, maintaining around two, anywhere between 2,000 to 3,000 feet for, uh, for this flight. Okay, so I'm going to hold that just there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to engage the autopilot. So the autopilot, or the, uh, the gyropilot as it's called, is controlled with three switches. So we've got this switch just here which turns the gyropilot on. 
that's now turned on. We then need to make a mechanical connection between that and the aircraft, which is this black lever just here. So let's turn that on. So now the autopilot is engaged. We can tell it to maintain level flight. And that is done with this switch just here. So if we flick that, I can now let go of my controls and the uh, aircraft, the gyro pilot, will maintain level flight as best it can, of course. Now, turning left and right, we can't set headings on this aircraft. We literally can just set a rate of turn. As you can see, the airfield's behind me, so we're going to make a left-hand turn and fly a, uh, a downwind leg. So this wheel just here we turn and it'll only let you turn so far of course that's the maximum bank and the aircraft you will now see is starting to uh, to turn left still maintaining level flight it's doing a great job <laughs> far better than i was so now we're effectively climbing at uh, what I'm going to be cruising at, called cruise altitude, uh, for today. We can get the flight engineer to run the cruise checks. Set cruise power, please. Setting cruise power. And again, the flight engineer should be controlling everything that it needs to do to set our cruise power level settings. Cruise power is set. And again, I've not touched anything with regards to um, the engines and uh, thrust levers. So we're still maintaining that turn. And one of the things that uh, I quickly discovered when I started flying this aircraft is you have to remember that this aircraft is not going to level itself back out. You need to do that. So as I say, we're going to fly, uh, we're going to fly a downwind uh, leg. I'm just trying to look see if I can actually see the airport. I can't. Um, but we're now coming to fly almost directly over the top of it. Uh, we are 14 miles away and we're now flying towards that. I don't want to fly exactly towards it, so I want to fly uh, just to down here and then we're going to come back in and uh, around to, uh, to land. So now let's start to level up and again do that by turning gently. You can see it literally does move the, uh, the control column to do that and you can also set it to make sure you are flying level by pressing this metal button just here. So if we press that you can see that flicks and uh, we should now be flying uh, straight and level. Now of course if you were at your proper cruising altitude just now, uh, sort of, I don't know, anywhere 12, 18,000, 24,000 feet, uh, you'd need to make sure you're uh, climbing around 165 knots all the way up there. Now there is a lot more information regarding that and the power settings that you need to maintain a decent crew uh, and a decent climb in the uh, in the rather large manual. So I'm not going to go into that basically because I've not had time to go into that before making this video. Uh, this is purely, as I say, sort of a, a start uh, a video to get you uh, get you started. And there we can see there's Doncaster Airport that we departed from. The ADF needle is pointing towards it. So I'm just going to fly through the ILS. You can see that's coming across nice and neatly just now. We're going to go down here. I'm going to make a right uh, fire a, uh, a right hand traffic pattern. So we'll just let that uh, continue for a moment. And then we'll turn right and fly parallel to that. Then we need to talk about slowing the aircraft down for landing. Now, this aircraft takes a long time to slow down, uh, around about 30 miles, which um, well, is obviously quite a lot. Consider it's a lot of time considering that we're not into the flying that fast to begin with. So let's now just make a right-hand turn. And we want to fly on a heading of around uh, 200. So, just watching the heading indicator. Uh, we're going to fly a heading of 200 as that's the exact opposite of the uh, runway we're going to land on, runway 02. So, just 
start to bring that back level slow that rate of turn down there we go and let's go level at uh, level at that should do quite nicely and we're now going to fly alongside the airport which uh, is probably just hidden by uh, hidden by this wing I think over there We've also got distance measuring equipment telling us how far we are away as well, so we're about five, uh, five miles away. So at 2,000 feet, my plan now is to fly down here until we see the glide slope starting to go above us. At that point, we'll make a right-hand base turn and come back in to land. So let's just talk a little bit more about, um, about that autopilot in case we missed it. So. The autopilot is turned on with this button just here. Once you turn the autopilot on to actually connect it up to uh, to the controls, you need to use the mechanical lever just here. Turn that on. Up is on. Down is off. You can then steer the aircraft using this uh, big disc here. And then in order to all hold your altitude level, you obviously can't set an altitude, you just hold a level altitude that uh, you're happy with, we then use this switch just here, the altitude uh, control. Now, there's three different settings for the autopilot. So the gyro pilot, which is what, uh, what mode we're in now, basically left and right, controlled by this uh, knob, Localizer, which isn't localizer uh, in the sense that you would know it, you can actually use the localizer setting to track VORs. So if I typed in a, a VOR frequency up here instead of an ILS frequency, and then just as you would track any other VOR using the OBS, then you um, would then, once you set that, the if you flick it to the localizer setting, then the aircraft would track the VOR course that. Um, that you've selected. The approach course then can be used to fly the ILS just as you would any other uh, any modern jet. However, it is limited in its capabilities. Don't try and do a full auto land. That will not, that will not end pretty. As much as I would love to be able to auto land this aircraft at the moment, because I certainly can't land it uh, uh, as well as well as I would like to. So the airfield is now well and truly behind us should be able to just uh, see that uh, in the distance and I've got live weather as well so we can see the uh, we can see we're just starting to skirt the, uh, skirt the clouds out at the moment so there is the airfield just there so we're going to just continue this, uh, this downwind lead until we're happy what I want to start doing now though is reducing speed because this can take quite a while so we're going to start slowing down. If we were going to descend from a much higher altitude, if we were doing a, a, a full flight, then you'd need to work out the top of descent. That, there are decent instructions in the manual with regards to how you should do that, and the two tutorial flights that come with the, with the aircraft as well. Uh, but basically, flying level you will slow down, but it can take up to 30 miles to do that. So we're now going to go um, and set in range. Normally you'd go to descent, but we're going to tell the, uh, the flight engineer that we're in range because we are, of course, only 10 miles away. Still, uh, still heading outbound from the airport though, at the moment. So in range. Okay, so now we are in range. We need to begin slowing the uh, slowing the aircraft down. The best way I've found to do this is to be able. We, we will need to be able to control all the uh, the power settings ourselves. Now, at the moment, because the flight engineer is active and taking control of that, we have no control over any of, of our uh, our throttle levers. If you want to gain control over those again. Then, if you come to the uh, the tablet and click abort, that disables the, uh, the flight engineer, which means now I should have control 
over my uh, my thrust levers. Okay, guys. So we're about to start slowing the aircraft down, ready for our uh, arrival back into Doncaster Sheffield Airport. So let's hop on board. Um, we're at 3,000 feet. We're going to start slowing the aircraft down. In order to do this, we want to be able to control the uh, the throttle settings. Now, the way to do that, we've obviously got the, uh, the flight engineer controlling things for us at the moment, but if we want to control our throttle settings, then let's click the abort button. That gives us control back over everything uh, power-wise. So in order to start descending, and uh, slowing down. Once you have descended, you want to have around about 30 miles to start slowing down. It takes a long time for this aircraft to slow down. Once we have clicked abort on here, we can now start setting our own power settings. So we're going to start to reduce power a little bit. We want to set around 26 in the uh, manifold pressure, so let's reduce that to uh, around about there, shown with these dials here. We want about 2,200 RPM, uh, as shown just here. That is the white lever just uh, just there. Oh, I'll move that one ever so slightly. We've got a bit of asymmetrical uh, thrust, so let's just move over here. Uh, let's just slow that around 2,200. There we go. It wasn't that far off to begin with anyway, was it actually? So let's just leave that there. What we should now start to see is the airspeed bleeding off. Uh, now, one of the problems that I was having uh, a moment ago, uh, which is where we just did the cutaway to the exterior view before coming back in, is I couldn't get my thrust uh, throttle levers to uh, to work. The reason is, and I keep forgetting this, there is a lock just uh, here, this red lever. If that is up there, you will not be able to move any of your, uh, your power settings. So make sure that it is unlocked by bringing that all the way back. Then you will be able to control them again. I was pulling my hair out trying to solve that uh, solve that issue. Uh, and in doing so, uh, we've flown a little bit further away from Doncaster Sheffield Airport than I had wanted to. This is where we currently are, and we were coming down here when I had the problem. We then cut away, I've done a circle, we're now gonna come back in and fly in from the, uh, from the south, uh, from the southeast. So we're gonna come in and this way and land on runway 20. So it's still this same runway but now let's make a left turn so we'll uh, still with the uh, the gyro pilot on we're gonna make that left hand turn and we can just see that the um, glide slope is starting to uh, to come alive and we're going to as i say start to uh, line up for a landing runway to zero, uh, sorry, zero to zero, and we're 20 miles away. Once we get speed down to around about uh, 175 knots, we're going to put 10 degrees of flaps down. So you can see the airspeed still slowly bleeding away. Uh, if it's not bleeding away fast enough, obviously just reduce that power a little bit, but you want to be very, very careful how you're reducing that power because you can obviously lose speed too quickly lose control and start to uh, start to descend towards the ground we don't want to do that I have done that a few times uh, whilst playing around with the aircraft not fun so we're obviously holding level flight at, uh, at the moment and if we want to slow down further we can now start to reduce the throttles even more to around about 100 BMEP. Sorry, not BMEP, manifold pressure. I keep getting confused between uh, between those two. But we're slowing down quite nicely now, so there we go. Let's set those, uh, let's sort those flaps out. And as I've been doing this, we're now gonna set 10 degrees of flaps, but what uh, I had uh, completely forgotten is that the aircraft although I knew which heading in my mind I wanted to set the aircraft didn't know that <laughs> and I just continued circling I mentioned that a little bit earlier didn't I and that's because uh, oh, I'm just used to being able to set a heading I can't set a heading on this aircraft so we'll come back around now and insert the, uh, the localizer in a second 
highly recommend having the VF armor upon while still learning this aircraft. Particularly if you're not familiar with navigating using uh, VORs and NDVs. So I want to be heading, uh, flying a heading around uh, 300. Uh, we can see that coming around just now. And then we'll intercept the localizer. 21 miles away, so plenty of time. And we obviously want to keep that speed so it doesn't start to drop off. Right, let's start bringing that aircraft back for level flight. There we go. So we can slow the aircraft down now by using the um, using the flaps. So around 165 knots or below we can select the next degree of flaps. So let's go ahead and do that. So that's down to 15. And obviously the flaps add extra drag but you've got to be careful as well. You want to prepare for that ballooning effect when you add the flaps of course. It will start to, uh, to lift the aircraft up. to do that, that's asymmetrical thrust, uh, just wanted to reduce that a little bit, there we go, we want to hold around about 90 to 100 BMEP as shown up here, uh, just to help us continue to slow down, and this is where practice is really going to come into its own. We can see the speed starting to bleed off a, uh, a little bit. Now, what the aircraft can do is, as I say, in low visibility, which visibility is not great at the moment, is it? It does have the ability to uh, track the ILS and the glide slope. So what I'm going to do now is I'm now going to flick over this into the approach. So I'm going to set that and the aircraft will start to stabilize hopefully in a second and it will start to track the localizer and the glide slope when that starts to uh, come in and we're not that far away from intercepting those to, uh, to be fair we can now add the next uh, notch of flaps, so flaps 20 at around 155 knots so there we go, we've got flaps 20 is now set As you can see, here's our aircraft, there's our airport, and we're going to be coming in and intercepting that localizer in the next couple of minutes. 16 miles out, speed again is holding quite nicely. So we should be at, um, we want to be at around 140 knots and 3,000 feet uh, above the airport, uh, at around 12 to 15 miles away. Well, there we go, we're coming up to 15 miles away. We've got 140 knots indicated there, so that's great. And we want to be flaps 20, we've just set that, flaps is 20. And we want BMEP to be around 100 and uh, 110, so we can perhaps just increase that ever so slightly. There it is. So once we are, uh, once we're there, we can look at um, running the before landing checklist, which means the uh, flight engineer is going to manage things like the flaps, gears, lights, propellers. Uh, all we will need to do is manage the throttle uh, just to help us with, uh, with our touchdown. All I'm looking for now is I want to make sure that the aircraft starts to track this uh, localizer as we are 30 miles away so let's now run the uh, before landing checks flaps 
So we're just watching that localizer starting to move. We can see we're banking as well to meet it as we've got the approach set just there. And the RPM is still being controlled by the flight engineer. We are just controlling the throttle. Okay, so a normal three degree glide slope, as you may be aware from watching the channel, 10 miles out, that's where we're going to intercept the glide slope. That is now taking place, and you should start to see the aircraft tracking that glide slope just now. Down, there he goes. Hopefully I'll take a moment to, uh, to settle. Remember though, and this is what I'm going to remember, is we're, uh, we're not flying a... Uh, Airbus. So at uh, sort of nine miles out, I'd still be looking at doing 180 knots. Well, we're only now doing 130 knots. So we've got lots of time for uh, for the aircraft to uh, to sort itself out. There we go. We've now got a visual of uh, of the runway, and the aircraft is tracking that quite nicely. Once I get a little bit closer, we will take the autopilot off and hopefully make a a nice landing. So we want to adjust the throttles to maintain a, a nice approach speed and ideally we want to be uh, sort of crossing over the threshold, I think it's around 100, 110, um, 110 knots, so as you can see that's starting to increase, so we're just going to roll that back a little bit now, doesn't want to be too much though, as you can see I'm putting the smallest amount of movements in on the thrust levers just show you that down there you can see very small but look at the way they affect um, the BMEP and the speed but that speed is looking a little bit too quick for me at the moment so I'm just going to reduce that a little bit more so this is where practice is going to come in with regards to um, landing the aircraft, not something I've had a lot of, and the autopilot is still on. So again, I've got my hand on my uh, throttle levers at the moment, I'm just trying to maintain a continuous speed around a 110, just a little bit over that at the moment, but uh, that looks good for the time being. And uh, you know, it's an old, old aircraft, but it's tracking this ILS beautifully. Oh, I've just got some fantastic views as well. I have set up custom views for uh, for this aircraft, which I will uh, no doubt share on this Discord server at some point. So the only thing left to do is hopefully have a nice touchdown. I appreciate this has been a long video, but I wanted to try and put as much into this single video as, as I could. Once again, this is by no means a, a must-do tutorial visual video. There, uh, there is far much, there's much more reading I need to do to be, uh, to be confident of what, uh, what I need to do here. You can just see now, as we're starting to get a little bit lower down, that aircraft is starting to waver a, a little bit. So, I'm getting ready now to disconnect as we are now below a thousand feet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off 
the uh, the gyro pilot. I now have control of the uh, of the aircraft. I'm going to press the space bar, which just allows me to look up a, a little bit, just so I get a little bit better pitch. I want to keep, obviously, I've got a great picture out the window, but I want to keep an eye on that speed as well. There's a little bit of wind today, just blowing us over from uh, <coughs> from the right. So I just need to try and track that centre line a little bit more. And it's also a bit of a crosswind actually. So I'm trying to maintain that centre line. Crosswind landing in a DC-6. <laughs> this could be interesting. Don't expect a, uh, a butter landing, guys. Now that's not looking too bad. Just watch we don't drop off too soon. I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to be in the bushes just before the end of the runway. A little bit of rudder just as we touch down, just as I would do in the Airbus actually. But that's not looking uh, that's not looking too bad at all. Start to reduce that thrust or that throttle. And touch down. There it is. See the speed bleeding off with the help of uh, with the help of the brakes. So there we are. That is a sort of a whistle stop tour of how uh, how to fly the DC6 um, straight out of the box. Hopefully there wasn't too much in there that, uh, that was complicated and uh, needs further reading. That should hopefully be enough to get you from point A to point B. I will look at doing a few more tutorials on tracking VORs and things like that. I will also be doing a few live streams in this aircraft just because I think it is absolutely beautiful and it combines my love of flying airliners with um, with old school VOR NDB navigation. What a beautiful aircraft. Big thanks to PMDG for providing me with a copy of this to showcase for you guys, and I hope you found that of use. If, however, you have got any comments, any questions, uh, or the, uh, the opposite, you've seen something that I'm not doing correctly in this video, as I'm sure there is plenty, then please do leave comments um, down below. I would love to read those and love to learn more about this uh, fantastic uh, retro aircraft. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Please hit the subscribe button, turn on the notifications bell for, uh, for more videos and uh, to be notified of uh, live streams. I look forward to seeing you all in the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.